Hey, it's Rakim, Emaxcast episode 4. Hello. <laughs> this this is so awkward. How do you start? Uh, hey, good morning, I guess. It is morning. I woke up uh, today to record this thing before all the noise starts. But there's still noise. S- some machines are working outside. There, There's a construction site nearby, so sorry if you hear some some noise. First, let's start with some news. Emacscast now has a website. It's emacscast.org. There was a website before. It came by default with the podcasting service that I use, which is Pinecast, by the way, a great service. There's also emacscast.com. Right now, it just redirects you to emacscast.org. But what's amazing is that this domain was taken. I couldn't get it. But a few weeks ago, I mean from emacs.el podcast, another emacs podcast, just wrote me and said, I have this domain, I planned to use it, but I didn't. So I can just give it to you for free. (laughs) He just gave it to me. How amazing is that? So now I have all the bases covered. I have emacscast.com going to emacscast.org, which is, I think, a nicer domain name for emacs-related projects. And that website is built using Hugo static site generator. I used to use Jekyll for all of my static websites, but recently, of course, because of Emacs, I wanted to find a way to create blog posts and just manage my blog or any other static website through Emacs and hopefully using org mode. And the best way I found is using org mode, using Hugo and having OX Hugo Emacs package between them. It's an amazing package that converts your single org file. You can have multiples, but by default, it's a single org file where you write all your blog posts and you can configure it in a way that you just hit save, you save that org file. It automatically generates all the markdown files for Hugo because Hugo just works with markdown and you just see the results instantly in your browser. This is amazing. I, I already converted my own blog, my personal blog, rakim.org, to this setup. And now I have emacscast.org following the same setup. So if you're interested, all the links are in the show notes. Uh, It takes a bit of work to set it up, but I think it's worth it. So now I don't have to create new files. I don't have to leave the editor. I don't have to do anything, basically. All I have to do is just uh, commit changes and push them. All the code... Uh, is on GitHub, and the website itself builds and deploys to Netlify. It's a free service. Of course, they have paid features, but the basic free service is that you can deploy simple websites, and it just looks at my GitHub, and every time I push there, it builds a new version and deploys it. You can add custom domains and uh, free SSL. So I'm pretty happy with, with this setup. There might be some bugs or rough edges, so let me know if you find something. Another thing I wanted to talk about briefly is one thing that worries me quite a lot about Emacs, or maybe about free software in general, or about open source in general, is that many times I feel that people who are working on these projects, they don't get enough compensation in different terms. It's a weird thing about people And I've seen it myself when working on different public projects, public facing projects on the internet, is that the cheaper your product is in terms of dollars, the cheaper it is, the more demanding an average user is and more angry an angry user is. In my business, when we started, we had a really low price point. We, We create online courses about programming and the first version was just a couple of bucks for uh, full access to all the courses. It was so cheap that we thought we'll just we'll cover more people. This is great. It, it has to be cheap. But the amount of feedback and sometimes negative feedback or in general, the way people didn't find everything they wanted to find was overwhelming. And over the course of next few years, we raised the bar. We, of course, did it because we had more content and more features. So we gradually raised the price point. Every time we went up, 
people, sometimes the same people who just started to pay more, started to basically be nicer. I'm not just saying they complained less. I'm just saying in general, they started to maybe appreciate it more. Somehow the monetary value affected the way they perceived the product and perceived the creators. On the flip side, open source and free software is free. If you look at GitHub issues of popular open source projects, sometimes it feels like <laughs> the complaints of other users are it just jarring. It, it feels sometimes like those people paid thousands and thousands of dollars and the thing doesn't work the way they want. So they just pour so much anger into those issues. But the thing is, they get it for free. And those people who worked on those projects, they just did it on their free time. They didn't get paid at all. So not only they, they're not getting money out of it, they are not even getting the appreciation, I think, as much appreciation as they should. Now, I know it's obvious, be nice to people, be nice to maintainers and help them, of course. We know all of that. But what worries me is quite often I see really popular package maintainers. I mean, maintainers of really pop popular packages and software and projects. I'm talking about really popular stuff. Sometimes stuff that is used by thousands and thousands of people, big companies. And sometimes I see those people struggle basically to pay the bills. I know they work somewhere and sometimes it's just about money. They just don't get enough money. And I know it's they chose to work on this free software. They believe in something. They, It's not like uh, someone forced them not to charge for their work. Uh, I'm not saying that. One example that made me think about this lately is Bastien Giri. I think I pronounced it. I just nailed it. Bastien is the maintainer of org mode. Org mode is one of the most popular packages for Emacs. And it has thousands and thousands of users. And many of those people use org mode every single day for years. They manage their lives with it. So this guy, a few months ago, this year, tweets, Okay, here is the situation. I badly need to replace my three-year-old dying computer. I can't afford to buy one. If you ever considered making a donation for Emacs org mode, but didn't take the time, now is your chance. Well, th that tweet helped him i think because three days later he said thanks to everyone i've just collected enough to buy a new computer and that's a huge relief another example is theory volpiato i think i nailed that name as well theory is the creator and maintainer of helm one of the most popular packages as well it seems that that package has more users than even majit or magit while I didn't see Theory struggling to buy a new computer, he struggles with Helm. And recently he announced that the development of Helm is stalled and he will only work on major bug fixes, at least for now. Some people start freaking out, like this package, I use every day what's going to happen. But uh, it seems like the guy just needs some... This is not the case where your money will help him recover faster, but I think it will help to see the appreciation that I know the world is not fair in a way that the amount of effort and the amount of work does not necessarily correlate with the reward. I don't know. I guess I didn't prepare enough for this uh, whole section. I still think you do understand what I'm trying to say. Basically, let's just help somehow. So I made a web page on GitHub that lists different Emacs related projects. It starts with Emacs itself with the Free Software Foundation and then lists some popular packages, but with the links to their creators or maintainers pages where you can help them with money. It's usually something like Patreon, where you can just uh, set some amount that will automatically be paid to them every month. It's sometimes just one time PayPal donation or a Libra Pay donation, something like that. Or sometimes you can uh, support them by buying stuff like merchandise, uh, maybe books, uh, stuff like that. Feel free to contribute to that page, add more people, more projects. All right, let's switch to config news. If you're listening this, if you're listening to this for the first time is when I cover what changed in my Emacs config since the last time we talked. 
last time was a few weeks ago. And since then, I think I finalized my essentials, basically all the things that I need out of the editor. I installed a couple of uh, new packages. Uh, move text allows me to move portions of text, uh, like bubbling up, bubbling down text within any buffer. And it's bound to meta up and down. In org mode, this behavior is built in. Um, so that package doesn't need to work in org mode. I installed multiple cursors. This is the main feature in Sublime Text for me. You can live without it. You don't need it in Emacs. You can do all the same stuff using replacement or using macros, but I think all of them are crutches when you have to quickly change multiple instances of the same text. Multiple cur cursors is just, by the way, it should we should call it multiple points, right? It's Emacs, it's not cursor. So anyway, multiple cursors are, I think the most visual and the most explicit way to go about this. I also modified my mode line a bit. I never understood why there's so much stuff in the mode line. All the minor modes, I think they are sometimes useful, but you can see them separately by showing by issuing a command. I don't think I ever need to see them all of the time. All I have in my mode line now is the status, if the file is saved or not, line number, percentage of the position, file name, and uh, git branch. And that's it. Which key is the package that I've seen in SpaceMax? And I thought it's a great idea. It helps discoverability. So now I can see when I start a key combination, a few moments later, basically a cheat sheet appears and it shows what other combinations are available starting with what I typed. So it makes Emacs a bit more transparent and, and discoverable. And another two packages is Neo tree, which is basically a file tree similar to nerd tree in Vim and company mode for auto completion. Standard stuff, uh, if you look at SpaceMax or Doom, which we are going to talk about this episode, both of them have most of those packages. I also reformatted my config a bit. I think it makes more sense and it's easier to explore now. The main topic for today is we're going to look at SpaceMax, Doom Emacs and compare them to vanilla Emacs. SpaceMax is a hugely popular community-driven distribution of Emacs. Pre-configured, pre-set up Emacs setup <laughs> configuration. In the simplest terms, it's just a replacement for your emacs.d directory. With Emacs, it's easy to try these things because all you have to do is backup your emacs.d somehow, just rename it, and then clone whatever is being distributed. Then relaunch Emacs and it will, it will just work. SpaceMax is created and maintained by Sylvain Benner. He lives in Quebec City, Canada, which is a nice city I, I visited several times. It's really actively developed. It's been like that for five years already. It started as an Emacs distribution focused on evil, evil mode. An evil mode is a Vim simulation layer on top of Emacs. It basically adds Vim-like modular editing to Emacs. SpaceMax is focused on ergonomics, mnemonics, and consistency. And the basic building blocks are, of course, Evil, Projectile to manage projects, Helm and Ivy, Witch Key, Power Line, a cool looking theme, and lots of sane defaults, lots of pre configured packages. SpaceMax is complex, it's, it's a huge thing. It adds complexity on top of Emacs. For example, packages installed in layers. A layer is basically a pre configured set of multiple packages. It might be a, a sane, good idea on top of default packaging system in Emacs. It's like an abstraction on top of a packaging system because often packages are quite small in the way that they work. But if you, for example, want, want your Emacs to work well with a particular programming language or a framework, you will probably need multiple packages for that. And SpaceMax understands this and a layer is a complete kit for a particular occasion. The cool thing is if you open a file in SpaceMax and it needs a layer to work with that file, it will 
prompt if you want to install that layer. And if you say yes, it will automatically download all the packages, install them, and then open the file, and it just works. This is similar to how VS Code works. This is really good and uh, removes lots of friction. As of today, you don't have to use evil mode in Space Max. When you install it first and start Emacs, it will go through some setup. It will ask a few questions like, do you want evil mode? Or you want to use default Emacs key bindings? And do you want to use Helm, which is heavier? Or do you want to just use Ivy, which is lighter but has less features? and some other questions, and you just answer them, and it takes a few minutes to set up everything and download everything, and after that, it just works. The idea was that the best editor is neither Vim nor Emacs, it's Vim in Emacs. So today, you can use Space Max without evil, but that's uh, it's, still, it's still a good choice, but uh, if you are listening to this, and if you are trying Space Max, chances are you want evil, you want Vim, key bindings. So evil mode is really an extensive Vim simulation. And I'm not a Vim user. I used Vim for maybe five months when I was learning a particular framework that, and my teachers were using Vim. So I just, I used that. I didn't love it, but I like many, many ideas from that. What I hear from experienced Vim addicts like people who use Vim for 5, 7, 10 years, most of them say that evil mode in Space Max is pretty much perfect. Everything they expect from Vim key bindings, it works in evil mode. Many editors like Sublime or VS Code or even uh, IDEs have some sort of Vim emulation available. None of them come close to the level of simulation that evil provides. The primary audience for Space Max seems to be Vim refugees. So if you look at uh, discussions and and just blogging about Space Max, quite often people who switch to Space Max are switching from Vim. Space Max uses the idea of a leader key. So most of the key commands start with space. You just hit space and then a combination of letters. And this is where the name comes from. It's space Max. And since it's set to be focused on ergonomics, mnemonics, and consistency, all of those available combinations are grouped into sections that make sense. For example, to work with Windows, to do anything with Windows, you hit space W and then some other letter or number. And for the most part, they try to follow the same conventions that are present in vanilla Emacs, but not always. And those details are a bit weird, to me at least. So, for example, if you hit space WO, which is, if you have to guess, window other, other window maybe, it actually switches to other frame, which I guess makes sense because windows are, because window is a modern name for a frame, but the mirror combination in vanilla Emacs is control X O, by default it switches to another window. So if you have that muscle memory than in Space Max, even though it's kind of the mirror, it's the same letter from the same group, it does a different thing. Space W2 creates two columns, basically creates a vertical split of windows, but Control X2 makes a horizontal split by default. So it's similar, but it's different, and it might be confusing if you know that combination. Space W1 doesn't do anything. That key binding doesn't work, which is surprising because all the other are mirrored in some way. If I had to guess, it should kill other windows because Control X1 kills other windows, but Space W1 doesn't do anything. But at the same time, switching to other windows is quite handy with space and the number. So if you have three windows, you can Space 1, Space 2, or Space 3. This is the fastest way I know of. With Evil Mode enabled, most of the default Emacs key bindings keep working, so you don't have to use only Vim key bindings. But not all of them. Some don't work. Space Max adds another layer on top of this, and sometimes default vanilla key bindings don't work in Space Max, and you're not sure if it's just because evil mode is enabled, or is it some other thing in Space Max that affects this. And I'm not talking about some obscure, weird combinations with multiple letters. Something that I use every day is transpose characters. Uh, it's Control T, but it doesn't work in Space Max for some reason. Of course, the reason is the main reason is 
you shouldn't really use it if you enable evil mode if you set up space max to use evil you just have to use those mnemonic commands so everything that works with text is prefixed with x in space max so you hit space x and then something so if you want to transpose a character you hit space x t c which is arguably harder to type than just control t and x t c means x for text t for transpose and c for character which is a bit confusing because well back then at windows we had w and it made sense because it's windows but for text it's x i guess because there is an x in text so i'm not trying to pick on on these small details of course if you use space max and if you use evil mode chances are you don't want default key bindings but even after a few months of emacs space max was a little bit confusing to use many many packages in emacs support evil key bindings in some way magit or magit i still have no idea how to pronounce it but i'm gonna say magit because it's like magic so magit supports evil key bindings uh, helm does of course most of the packages that come in layers of space max support evil key bindings because that's the whole idea so as i said space max adds this whole layer of complexity a whole new config system on top of emacs so you still have your init.el but it just points to the space max config which is dot space max directory it's still elisp it's still something you can just read and understand and it has a lot of comments so if you look at the space max configuration it's so easy to understand what's going on there are lots of comments lots of explanations it's it's quite approachable as as far as configs go most of the configs are made through some custom functions so something simple like setting a font size it's not just that one expression in your regular config which you can evaluate and change the font size on the fly it's inside some other function that does some other bootstrapping in in space max but of course editing a config in space max comes with some additional commands there is a key combination that starts with space of course that you hit to open the config and then there's other configuration that you hit to re-evaluate or reapply that config i guess the the overall idea of of what i'm trying to say is space max is great it has lots of features but it is not built for those who want to dig into emacs itself you can dig into space max and have fun with that but every time you want to dig into emacs through space max go deeper something unexpected will happen it's still there it's it's not like they wrapped a whole other operating system around emacs but it's kind of like that it's 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 a thin but quite complex layer to sum up advantages of space max is well it's very well configured it's curated and it just works i've seen many comments from people who said something like i've been growing my emacs config for months and months and i'm still not happy and then i just tried space max and everything just works and yeah everything just works the development of space max is quite active it updates frequently and it also has auto update notifications so if a major update comes you won't miss it this layer thing seems to be a good idea like a sane well thought through abstraction over default packaging system it kind of plays against your natural emacs desire to control little things like i want to configure everything exactly the way i want and layer takes a bit away from that because it's not just a package that is installed it's a set of packages and configurations for those packages of course you can still edit those but the whole space max philosophy seems to a little bit negate the customization selling point of emacs and it's not a bad thing the whole customization selling point is kind of recursive in a way that it's so customizable that you can create an emacs distribution that is not customizable that's how customizable emacs is it's not a bad thing not all emacs users want to fiddle with emacs not all emacs users 
are enjoying listening to these podcasts. Some just want tool that works, updates, and you don't have to dig inside. But you just have to keep this in mind. If you are one of those who want to fiddle and want to control everything and you want to grow your own configuration, Space Max might not be the best choice, even though it's just a great product. So I guess I moved from advantages to disadvantages quite smoothly. So I will just continue. Space Max is not beginner friendly uh, in a sense that if you are a beginner user of Emacs, it doesn't explain Emacs to you. Even the documentation, you start reading it. If you have no idea what Emacs is, you will be probably lost. And I wouldn't recommend Space Max if you are starting to learn Emacs. As I said, not all vanilla key bindings work, but there's no way to know if some particular instance is due to Space Max or Evil Mode or some package or some layer or some combination of those. Many aspects of Space Max make Emacs more transparent, but this one makes it more opaque. If something doesn't work and you read it in some Emacs book or tutorial, you don't know what's going on. You don't know how to uh, how to go about this. When it comes to choosing, I think there are essentially two options and both are bad. <laughs> Hear me out. First option is you start early. You don't know Emacs, you just start with Space Max, everything works, you're happy, but you learn the non-standard ways of doing things. Non-standard for Emacs, but of course standard for Space Max. If you, after that, try to do something with Emacs itself, you will struggle with unrelevant tutorials and help. And I've heard this from people that if you have a problem and you go to some say Emacs forum or IRC, you say, I have this problem. I I don't know what to do. Here's my configuration and I use Space Max. Sometimes people just are unwilling or unable to help you because, well, they don't use Space Max and it's not just like another package in Emacs. It's a whole other layer. So when something doesn't work, most of Emacs people cannot help you because, well, you have too much of unknown for them. So if you have a problem with Space Max, you will probably have to go to Space Max community, which is active and good, but it's smaller. And many things that you read about Emacs will not work or will work unexpectedly. So this is option one. Start with Space Max, but struggle with Emacs. Option two is start with Emacs. And then after some time when you are comfortable, switch to Space Max, try that. The bad thing about this is now you have all the muscle memory. You learned Emacs, you learned the Emacs ways, and now you have to relearn. Even if you don't choose evil mode, even if you use Space Max with Emacs key bindings, some things will be different just because Space Max is that huge. I think it reinforces the idea that Space Max is primarily for those who are switching from Vim. They A, have no desire to learn Emacs, and B, they don't have to learn or relearn. They transfer their Vim knowledge to this new environment. And with evil mode, this extensive Vim emulation, most of the things they are used to just keep working. And the final disadvantage is, as you can imagine, it's quite slow. It's not as slow as, say, some IDEs like Eclipse, uh, but it's slow-ish. It's slower than your regular Emacs config. Uh, It has a lot of packages and a lot of things going on, uh, so it's quite, quite heavy. The good thing is, of course, you can make your own Space Max. You don't have to go with the full distribution. If you see some good ideas there, you can just take them. Layers, actually, it's a great thing, not only if you use layers, but just to look at. Because, say, a layer for a particular framework is well thought through. A lot of people thought about what should go into that layer. And if you just open that file and look at what packages and what configurations are in there, it will help you build your own config. So look into layers, try different packages that Space Max uses, like WitchKey, Helm, Projectile, Evil, and just steal. That's what I'm doing. All right, that was Space Max. Another big player in pre-configured Emacs distributions is Doom Emacs. Doom is created by Henrik Lissner. This I did not nail, I think. It's some Nordic name. It's probably pronounced in some cool way that is unavailable to me at the moment. But Henrik lives in Toronto, which is another Canadian city. So Space Max is in Quebec. Doom Emacs is in Toronto. 
it's not as big of a project, but it's still going for a long time. It, it's still actively maintained. It's a bit over four years old. It's fast. It's opinionated. It's super opinionated. And it's much lighter than Space Max. On the homepage, it says, It is a story as old as time. A stubborn, shell-dwelling, and melodramatic vimmer, envious of the features of modern text editors, spirals into despair before finally succumbing to the dark side. This is his config. Doom tries to be fast, fabulous, and hacker-friendly. It says it all. It's just a guy who was a vimmer, and he tried to make Emacs as much of vim as possible, embracing evil mode and other Emacs features. The basic building blocks are the same. It's evil mode, it's projectile, helm and IV, and company mode for auto-completion. It's still a new layer on top of Emacs, but it's much thinner. So there is less space between you and Emacs when you use Doom. There is a similar thing to layers, and it's called modules. And the idea is the same. It's a set of packages for a particular use case. There is a custom declarative package managing system based on these modules and the use package package. Most of the configuration and updates are done through make files. So of course, the configurations are usual ellipses, nothing unusual, but to update, to make changes, you have to go to the terminal and do make install or just make. This thing is less polished than Space Max. Uh, I think less people are working on that. And it shows in little details. It's quite amazing, but it, you can feel that it is a bit less polished. It is very opinionated, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. If you agree with the decisions the author makes, then this package is a dream for you. If you don't agree with something, of course you can still customize it, but that will be going against the current, basically. It's really fast. As I said, it's lighter than Emacs. There's less stuff going on. And there's the whole section in the configuration that describes what was done to make Doom Emacs start really fast. Also, it looks quite amazing. It, uh, the default theme that if you just go to the web page and see the screenshot, it looks really, really nice. So you can, of course, just take that theme and take the mode line and take, uh, take everything that you want from the visual side and put it in, in your own config. But uh, if you just go with the default Doom Emacs, it will look like that and it's quite nice. It's not beginner friendly at all. It's not beginner friendly even compared to Space Max. Doom assumes a lot of knowledge about both Emacs and Vim and the way just basically your terminal works. So I would definitely not recommend Doom for beginners. As I said, it's very opinionated. So now it's a disadvantage as well. And the module ecosystem is not as good as, but that's just because Doom is a bit less popular than Space Max. So my suggestion, if you are Emacs curious and you want to learn as much as possible, you want to dig inside, then definitely start with vanilla, empty Emacs, explore, get comfortable and grow your own config. There might be a time where you just ditch that config and start from scratch, but it still is an important phase. Just try it. When you get comfortable with default key bindings and you see if it works for you or if you think it's stupid and you think you have to modify a lot of things or you love it, once you are basically comfortable editing simple text, then try evil mode yourself. Just install evil and see how it works. By the way, evil is not the only model editing package for Emacs. Evil is just the, the most popular because it emulates Vim. But there are other things like goad mode, for example, that follows the same idea that you have at least two modes, one for inserting text, just typing, and another for commands. So if you like the idea of model editing, but, but don't necessarily like Vim approach, then try goad mode and some other packages. Just Google model editing Emacs. So after you've tried evil or some other model editing package, then try Space Max or Doom. At that point, you are comfortable in both Emacs default key bindings and model editing philosophy. But if you start from a different position, if you want something that just works out of the box, you're not interested in customization, you're not interested in 
digging under the hood, then by all means start with Space Max. This could be a gateway drug for, for many people, if, and it is a gateway drug for many people. I know people start with Space Max, they probably are switching from Vim, and then they start fiddling a bit and they see, oh, I can configure everything, it seems. So if you start fiddling with, with Space Max and you start feeling that you want more customization, then maybe consider switching from Space Max or Doom to Vanilla and getting all those good ideas that you like, ditching all the ideas that you don't like and growing your own configuration from there. All right, that's it for today. Thank you. Hopefully you enjoyed this. See you next time in episode five. I'm not sure what it's going to be about, but I'm happy to hear your suggestions. An idea I want to propose is that I will talk about this OX Hugo org mode, Hugo Netlify setup. So basically blogging from Emacs and org mode. There are other solutions that uh, I can cover as well. So let me know comments on the Reddit where I'm going to post this, or you can always email me or tweet at me. Thank you. Bye-bye.